Last year, I put out a video called The Golden Calf Abolishing Copyright Law. It's pretty good, if I do say so myself, but I also think it's kind of incomplete. It's definitely more about the theory than the praxis. With this video, I'd like to fill in the spaces of how I believe art should function under capitalism, preferably without being possessed by a libertarian this time. One day, someone's going to rip your work off wholesale and sell it under their own name. After you find it, however, it's easier than ever to prove you were the original author, and soon the plagiarizer will face widespread ridicule and you will have gained a thousand new fans. Your mileage may vary. It's okay, guys. The market will sort everything out. <laughs> but anyway, watch that video first and then come back here. I'll wait. This might seem like an odd place to start, but it's important that I make this clear so we can get on the same page. So, here's a thought experiment. Let's say I have an idea for a movie. It's a simple hero's quest narrative with a MacGuffin and lots of characters. The main character is an everyman who is thrust into being responsible for transporting the MacGuffin to a place far away from home without letting anyone else have it. This is because the MacGuffin is effectively a weapon of mass destruction. The main character can only carry it because he, unlike the armies and warlords who seek the MacGuffin, doesn't desire power, but conflict arises as he slowly becomes tempted by the MacGuffin's evil corrupting power because it's magic. This is a ripoff of The Lord of the Rings, but at what point did this move from an idea to a ripoff? Maybe you think it's still an idea, just a derivative one, but what if I made the MacGuffin a magic ring, named the main character Frodo, set it in a place called Middle-earth? What if my movie is just beat for beat identical to The Lord of the Rings with new actors? Now it's a remake, but when did it go from being a ripoff to being an adaptation? But what happens when I take the assets, like the CGI models, the miniatures, the motion capture data from Andy Serkis? What if I copy the music from the original? What if I hire the same actors, or possibly even use entire clips from The Lord of the Rings to fill in space? What if I just copy the entire film without remaking anything? Okay, now it's piracy. You may know exactly when this stopped being just a similar idea and started being theft, but I hope you can acknowledge that everyone draws this line in a different place. The transition from innocuous idea to outright theft is completely unbroken and gradual. I personally see no distinction. An idea and a complete piece of art are the same thing, just at different scales. The entire text of the Lord of the Rings trilogy can be considered a very specific idea. Now let's get on with the analysis. What is the most resilient parasite? said Leonardo DiCaprio playing the part of Dr. Cobb in the 2012 movie Inception directed by Christopher Nolan. Good question. In this scene, the parasite Dr. Cobb refers to is an idea. Good ideas take root in the minds of their hosts, festering until the idea is expressed in some way. This is just how humans work. If you disagree, you might be a robot. But Mr. Cobb doesn't really go that in depth. Maybe because the theme of the movie is how ideas and insecurities can grow and corrupt individual minds and it would distract from that. What Cobb doesn't mention is how perfectly and scarily contagious these ideas can be. Anything can deliver an idea directly to someone's mind, any medium which can harbor language or meaning. We as a society have accepted this, we deliver ideas to each other constantly through speech, but sometimes we create tiny vessels to convey ideas automatically. We call these vessels art. Art in its purest form is objects in deliverance of ideas, usually with the intention of evoking emotion but not always. Sometimes the idea being delivered is a story, sometimes the idea is a representation of something, sometimes the idea is just the artwork itself as an experience. Art usually has more than one idea contained within itself though, like a deeply nested set of sets that vary in complexity. But this all exists within the mind of course, it is created by the observer. I have spoken of this before, but a piece of art is worth nearly nothing without the value that human and observation brings to it. I might go as far to say that this fractalized weave of concepts that the brain conceives of as it gazes upon any nondescript piece is the art, not the meat space material that inspired it. This might sound counterintuitive, but this is actually an accurate way to describe how humans talk about works of art. When one speaks of the Mona Lisa, it is reasonable to assume they are usually speaking of the act of seeing and experiencing the painting in a gallery. What they saw, what they felt, no thought is given to the painting as a physical object. This divide is even easier to see with more widespread pieces. When a group of friends see Inception in their home theater, the value of the disc the film came on never comes into discussion. It is simply the idea of Inception. These friends speak of all copies of the film simultaneously as the idea is consistent. There is only one Inception. The disc it came on is irrelevant. When you read Twilight, you aren't reading any particular copy of Twilight. You are reading capital T Twilight as delivered by the paper and ink medium you hold in your hands. 
When you play Bioshock, you are consuming the one and only Bioshock by way of your computer or gaming console simply being ordered to work under a certain set of rules. How it is being given these rules, disc or file, has no bearing on the work you are consuming. So basically, every artistic work exists as two separate entities, its physical self and the experience or ideas it provides. For convenience, I will call the meat space material side the medium and the ephemeral idea side the art. Some art movements, like minimalism, have been centered around bringing the medium and the art closer together, but the experience of something will always be separate from the thing itself. So, why am I explaining all this? Well, nearly every problem I have with how art and artistic labor are treated under capitalism is brought on by these two entities being conflated. So, we've just established that art is made of two entities, and the answer to this question is different for each side. The medium is worth its weight. That copy of Twilight you're reading cost labor to print, and you paid for the privilege of being able to hold it in your hands. Finding out the value of the art, on the other hand, is much more tricky. I've already shown that art isn't exactly a product, it only exists between minds, but this is just the beginning. The capital T Twilight that you siphon from by way of that little bundle of pulp you're holding isn't actually a constant and universal entity. For one, any modern art snob will tell you that the context in which a piece of art exists is nearly as important as the art itself. We've known this since 1917. But in the context of this new definition of art, this means that every piece of art is transforming into a new work every second it is allowed to exist within our world. The 1982 film Tron was a product of its time, but since its release it has managed to become a time capsule of the endless optimism that was present within the very beginnings of the internet age. And now, Tron is a flawless movie. Don't at me. It wasn't always flawless, though. Technically, it's a new piece of art now, but we don't call it a new film because that would be silly. It gets even squishier, though. To explain it simply, let's look at that dress meme from 2015. Is it yellow and white or blue and black? Apparently no one can agree. I personally see a dull forest green and light periwinkle, but that's besides the point. If you look at a technically under our new definition of art, there's two photographs here. And this isn't limited to quirky viral optical illusions. No two people see a piece of art in exactly the same way. The art is unique to the beholder. In a sense, a new piece of art is created in the heads of every human that looks upon the medium. It isn't a commodity. Even attempting to place a value on it is a fool's errand. But here's the tricky thing. It isn't free either. The labor to create the medium is measurable, but there's labor in artistic creation as well real and honest energy goes into these ideas. It can't be quantified, but it's there. That's where the real value is, artistic labor. But this is where I diverge from the rest of society who are adamant to place the value on this squishy piece of idea cotton candy instead of the actual work that went in. That's the true function of copyright law, to enforce the commodification of the wrong half of art while leaving no protection for the actual labor. If you've been following me so far, a couple problems may have already come up in your head. So, like, we can pretend that art is a saleable good when the medium is a tangible object, but what happens when the medium becomes intangible? I'll stop beating around the bush. The sale of digital goods doesn't make logical sense in any way. There is zero labor in copying a file. The paywalls that artists put around their digital art are brought into existence by the artist only, as they demand people pay them to bring it down. In fact, the rise of digitally distributed art should mean the detachment of art from the medium. It's the closest in history that the medium has managed to act as the art, able to be transmitted and perceived by every human in a grand network. In an ideal society, you already own every piece of digital art ever put onto the internet in the same way that you own a tiny version of Inception as soon as you finish watching it. It's just waiting to be downloaded onto your machine and consumed. The long and short of it is that putting a price tag on a packet of data is stealing it from your audience and charging them for you to return it. My solution is to reframe digital sales of art as what they are. Donations. Take my Bandcamp, where my albums are sold under a Name Your Price scheme. They're free, but people are allowed to pay as much as they want in order to pretend that they're making an exchange. There's nothing wrong with making money off of donations, as long as you call it what it is. So I have established that I believe the value of art lies in its creation, where the value of the medium exists only after completion and distribution. But when the medium has no value, neither does the art. All the value has been brought back to the creation process. So why do we as a society pretend this art is a commodity? It's strange we're so far past the age wherein we traded these effigies. Just see, if you think carefully, you've already decided to come with me. Art is two, only one is sold, the other stews and flies out free.
I held my hand right through the door so the value won't be misplaced anymore. Let you realize the art and the medium are torn, a world of ideas is about to be born. It's facts, your terrain of stats fall flat in the new world order of fan art and mashups. In the end, we're just stealing it back. We all know sky's the limit, so let's get dressed. Straight to the moon and back. Blackberry has an apple that is jazz. Let's all write fan fiction. You win, hey, let's do it. Straight to the moon and back. The world is built on a DJ's track. It's jazz. Let's all get lost in a dish. It's jazz. You win, hey, let's do it. So let's get dressed Straight to the moon and back I heard Blackberry has an apple that is jazz Let's all write fan fiction You win, hey, let's do it Straight to the moon and back The world is built on a DJ's track It's jazz Let's all get lost in a dish It's jazz You and I, let's do it Straight to the moon and back I heard that there is an app of that Let's all write this fiction You and I, let's do it Straight to the moon and back The world is built on a DJ's track It's jazz Let's all get lost in a dish It's jazz You and I, let's do it So let's get trapped. So let's get trapped. Don't you think creators should be rewarded for their efforts? This is probably the most common response I get when I express my criticisms of copyright law, and uh, yeah, creators should gain monetary compensation for their work. Ideally, every human on this earth would receive monetary compensation for being alive, or well, ideally we would abolish the commodity form and money entirely, but that's a bit far off. There are some inherent flaws in a capitalist system that kind of hamper what I'm saying. Yes, I'll admit that if copyright law was abolished tomorrow, then all hell would probably break loose. But I still don't think we need to abolish capitalism before we abolish copyright law. Really, the only change that needs to happen is a serious shift in where we as consumers perceive value in art. I won't dance around the issue. The biggest grievance that others have with my views is the fact that the societal changes I preach will essentially eradicate any ability that creators have to distribute their work and make money off it post-creation. This is unavoidable, and I wouldn't want to dress it up any other way. But I believe this concern stems mainly from a deficit in perspective. Artists buying into the commodification of art born out of copyright. In my opinion, y'all are underselling your work when you act as if this is the most valuable method of turning a profit when working in a creative field and must be protected at all costs. I'm sorry, I really can't see why this is a big deal. My video, Capitalism and Art, goes into more detail. I think it holds up mostly. The main point is that relying on the sale of your art post-creation to make money is a terrible idea and it'll make your art worse. But more importantly, in a market model dependent on popularity, there is a maximum number of artists who are even allowed to make a profit at any given time. That's just one of the basic flaws of capitalism. Technically, anyone can succeed, in theory, but you can't have everyone at the top. It's it's even worse with art, because its value isn't guaranteed. The sale of art under capitalism is irrevocably broken, and copyright didn't fix shit. But here's the real problem. What happens when the conflation of medium and art goes the other way? Because what I'm saying isn't wholly new. We have piracy, as a result of the general populace waking up to the downright arbitrary price tags that are put onto digital art. When a graphic designer is hired to make a logo for a website, the product they create has no value, but the labor that they put in is in dire need of compensation, and this should not be missed as our society grows more and more digital. So again, let's bring the value to where it belongs. Artistic labor is grossly undervalued in our current society, and there's no reason it shouldn't be. The sale of artistic labor by artists is what should be protected at all costs, because it is the only sale of art that makes physiological sense. This is important. 
because the world is changing and no one knows what's real anymore. More and more people are living by way of ephemeral packets of data and reality is getting less and less objective. More accurately, reality was never objective and we're just now getting the tools to find that out. Now, this video might sound a bit pessimistic, because I didn't exactly offer up any good alternatives for the system we have now. This is admittingly a failing on my part, but hopefully in the future we can find a way to allocate the value we assign to ideas upon the labor that went forth to create those ideas. Thank you for your time.